Hey, uh, my name is Dave Rovell, and I have the privilege of serving as the lead pastor here and just want to say, man, it is really great to see faces again. Last week we were back in person, but this week we're back in person with a lot more people, uh, which is a great thing. So glad to see all of you back. Uh, those of you who are online, I'm awesome that we can have that opportunity uh, and technology to be able to have you be part of this service as well. And looking forward to having you back. Uh, in person when that can happen, as I'm sure you are as well. So uh, before we dive into today's message, I want to do a little exercise. And this little exercise, for those of you online, you can still join. But here's what I want. I want you to think, I've just handed you $50 million. Okay? Probably in the form of a check because that'd be a lot of cash. So $50 million, what do you do with this $50 million that you've just received? So I want you to turn to somebody near you if you're online uh, at home, if someone's not sitting next to you, find someone in your house and have this little discussion. You've got just a minute or so. What would you do with a, fit, a gift of $50 million? Go. All right, if the other person hasn't talked yet, this might be their turn to talk, so go ahead. <laughs> All right, $50 million. I'll tell you what, uh, you know, that would be so much fun to be able to do. I would love to be able to give someone $50 million. That, that would just, one, it would just be like, I would love to see their face like, okay, so like, am I being punked here? What's going on? It's like, what, what's going to happen if I go and try to cash this check? And uh, when they find out that it's real, uh, you know, I just handed you $50 million, just like, I would love to see what that reaction. I would, I would hope that if someone handed me a check for $50 million, I would just be like, oh my goodness, you are like my new best friend, right? <laughs> it's like, what, just, what did I do to deserve this? What's going on? And just my, I would just be like, whoa, this is the most amazing gift I've ever received and just amazing. Side note, uh, this is not anywhere in my notes or my thought plan for this message, but hey folks, we have more to offer people than a check for $50 million. We have Christ. And uh, so just keep that in mind. Side note, evangelism talk to be done later. All right, so we are continuing in our book study overview on the book of James. We're in James chapter 5. And if you've been doing the challenge that I put out there, and I am... I am not overly optimistic on the percentages of who has been doing the challenge. Hopefully, it's a good percentage. But if you've been reading through the book of James while we've been doing this, you know James chapter 5 is the final chapter of this book. And so we're going to be diving into this. All sorts of things we could be diving into in this final chapter. And real tempted to dive into some of the other areas because, quite frankly, it would have been easier to talk about but really felt God leading me to say, nope, you get to start and stay at the first part of James chapter 5. And if you've been reading James and you've read James chapter 5, you know it's all about money. Yay! <laughs> He's talking about money today. Why did we pick today to come back? <laughs> right? Not always a fun topic. You know, it's one of those that you're supposed to avoid when having conversations with people, politics, money, religion. Well, here we are, we're the church, and we're going to, you know, we talk about all of those. Um, but so wealth warning uh, is what we're going to be talking about today. And I want us to keep an open mind 
no matter where you are on this spectrum of what James has to say. Because I think uh, as we go through this, at, at the end of this, we're going to realize even though James is talking about rich people, James is talking about all of us. And so let's take a look at what James chapter 5 has to say. Starts off, now listen, you rich people. Oh, warning. This is not a fun passage of scripture, and he's not very nice. Okay, here we go. Now listen, you rich people. Weep and wail because of your misery that is coming on you. Woohoo! Uh, your wealth has rotted, and moths have eaten your clothes. Your gold and silver have corroded. Their corrosion will testify against you and eat your flesh like fire. Sounds more like a Halloween story than a book of the Bible right now. You have hoarded wealth in the last days. Look, the wages you failed to pay the workers who mowed your fields are crying out against you. <clears throat> the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord Almighty. You have lived on earth in luxury and self-indulgence. You have fattened yourselves in the day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered the innocent one who, who is not opposing you. Not exactly the cheeriest passage of scripture. And if you read it, and for some of us, we're like, that's right, James. You go after those rich people. Right? I mean, James is like, you, I mean, he's just like, you rich people. And then this, all these bad things are going to happen. And it's real easy for us to sit back and go, yeah, uh-huh. Because when we think of rich people, I don't know about you, but I think of movie stars, uh, pro athletes, people that have, for some reason, made all sorts of money doing absolutely nothing, a.k.a. Kardashians. You know, you've got all these people who, when we think of rich, boy, I'll tell you what, you, you can start naming off all of these famous rich people. And it's real easy to just kind of point fingers and go, that's right, James. You let them have it because they deserve it. The interesting thing is, in my life experience, I've actually gotten to rub shoulders with and connect with and talk to and get to know some pretty wealthy people. Uh, one person that I, I was able to get to know through my different mission trips to Mexico, uh, he multi, 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 multi millionaire. He has a compound down in Mexico, Cabo San Lucas area, that has over seven houses on this compound that looks down on the beach, and every one of the houses has its own infinity pool. You know, the kind that that like has no edge on one side, and the water just kind of flows, and when you're in the pool, it looks like you're in the ocean as well. You know, it's over seven houses in this one complex. And down the beach a little ways is the hotel that he owns. And when we did mission trips for a while, we would stay at his hotel. In between his hotel and his compound is Sammy Hagar's uh, Cabo home. For those of you who don't know who Sammy Hagar is, uh, that's okay. Uh, Sometimes Sammy doesn't know who Sammy is. So he's, he's a rock musician. He owns a club down in Cabo San Lucas. Uh, I got to talk to some of his nephews and nieces one day on the beach. It was an interesting experience. Uh, I've, I've gotten to know pro athletes. Uh, I, I knew a GM of an NFL football team. Why am I saying all this? Because some of the rich people that I've gotten to know I don't look at this passage of scripture and go, yeah, James, let them have it. Because some of the rich people that I know, for example, the guy with the compound in the hotel, well, the hotel, he, he doesn't charge us when we go down for a missions trip. He's also in the process of trying to build a children's hospital in Cabo San Lucas because he knows that the kids in Cabo San Lucas can't afford it and he wants to build a children's hospital that's completely free for the local children. So it's kind of hard to look at him and go, yeah, let him have it, James. And I also, the GM of an NFL football team when I was going to be doing a missions trip, a year-long missions trip to Australia, he pretty much funded my my trip there because his family always supports a, a missionary all on their own and the missionary they were supporting at the time came back and retired and he said well we need to find a new one 
Wow. All of a sudden it's like, wow, we can't point to all rich people. But let's take a look at the passage because it's still there, right? Now listen, you rich people. So who's James talking about? Well, maybe we need to redefine rich. Do you realize here in America, we are so blessed just to be in this country alone? According to a website, How Rich Am I? If you are a family of four living in America and you make $24,000 a year, you are richer than 77% of the world population. 24 grand. Now, 25,000 is a uh, poverty, poverty level for a family of four in America. But you're still richer than 77% of the population of the world. You know, on some of those mission trips I've been a part of, uh, Cabo San Lucas, we were working at a daycare uh, that it was up on the hills, and you could look down and you could see the Sea of Cortez where the cruise ships would come in. And that daycare was for single moms that were working in the resorts. And at the time, they were making about $5 a day working in the resorts. They're down there, and they have a view of the cruise ships sitting in the harbor. Think about that. You're making $5 a day. You do the math, and you realize how much you know how much people are paying to be on a cruise ship for a week. And here you are, you're working $5 a day. We used to go to Jamaica for mission trips. The one village we worked in, they have one faucet for the entire village. And it's on, I think it was three days a week. So while we're there working in the village, it was the day that the faucet was turned on, and it was only in the morning. So all of a sudden, the entire village is there with their water jugs filling up the water. My Amy and I, we, uh, you know, we just moved into our house, and you, you got to kind of get stuff to make your house a home. And we have a storage area, but we want it uh, shelving to store some of our stuff. So we're looking online, trying to find. And boy, I tell you, this whole supply thing is real. We'd find the shelvings we want. We're like, let's order those. Oh, they're out of stock. OK, let's order those. Oh, they're out of stock, right? And we're getting frustrated trying to find shelving for storage. And this morning, it struck me. I'm buying shelves to store stuff. How rich am I? So. Now listen, you rich people, if you have running water, if you have a pretty good idea where your meals are coming from, the rest of the world is probably looking at you going, yeah, rich person. Weep and wail because of the misery that is coming on you. What misery? What, 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 what's James talking about? Your wealth has rotted and moths have eaten your clothes. Your gold and silver are corroded. Their corrosion will testify against you and eat your flesh like fire. You hoard it wealth in the last day. Your gold and silver have corroded. Now, if you know anything about gold and silver, they don't corrode. What James is trying to point out here is, look, the misery that's coming is when you realize everything you're gathering is worthless when compared to God and God's glory. Even your gold and silver that supposedly is so pure and won't corrode or rust, James is saying, in, in light of God's glory, yes, it will. It will be worthless. And if you are the person who is getting caught up in the trap of, I need to gain, I need to gain, I need to gain, boy, a harsh reality is coming your way. He continues. Oh, no. Well, we're there now. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Now here, I want to step back. I'm not saying money's bad. This verse has been misquoted a gazillion times. Usually it's money is the root of all evil. Now money is not bad. For example... 
a ball bat is not bad. Now, if you take said baseball bat to your neighbor's car and smash all the windows out and smash up the hood and all that, all of a sudden now you've done something bad with it, but the bat in itself isn't bad. Money in itself is not bad. It's not evil. Timothy, Paul writing to Timothy is saying the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. It's the, the desire that this is what I need to have. This is my number one goal. This is what I shoot for. This is what I want. This is my, my, whole, my whole value, my whole identity. Now, you know, it's kind of fun, right? There, there are some people out in the world who have iPhones, and then there's the rest of us smart people who have Androids, right? <clears throat> so, so right now, I've already divided the congregation. Right? Good job, Dave. Church split over Apple and Android. Right? I am obviously an Android user, and then there's iPhone users. And it's so funny because you can get in this big debate of what's more important, what's the better, and you almost, right, you can almost see some people, their identity is in, I have an iPhone, or, or I have the latest Google phone. It's like, who cares what kind of phone you have? It's like, you know, half of us are like, yeah, I've got this phone. I use like 25% of its capabilities, but I have it, <laughs> you know, and I play solitaire. And, but when we start, our identity is in our wealth. When our value is in our bottom line. When our security comes from our resources. That's when it becomes a love of money. And when we cross the line over into a love of money, rather than seeing money as a tool that can be used for amazing things, yes, taking care of ourselves and our family, but also helping out those who are in need, doing things like going out and filling up a, a shoebox full of toys and hygiene products, donating for turkey and mashed potatoes and green beans so someone can have a Thanksgiving meal seeing someone that could use a coat and buying them a coat. See, James, I think when we look at it and he's saying you rich people, I, I think we need to look at it and go, what is our focus on money? Are we trying to become one of those rich people? And that's where we're finding our identity? Or are we just trying to say, God, bless me with whatever you're going to bless me, and I'm going to use it however you want me to use it. Because remember, last week we were talking about submit to God. Earlier in James, we were talking about don't just hear the word, but do it. And the Bible, I'll tell you what, the Bible has a lot to say about money, and a lot of what the Bible has to say about money is you need to be helping those in need around you, and you need to be obedient to whatever God tells you to do. So, but those who are eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierce themselves with many griefs. And James talks about those griefs of, oh my goodness, you're going to have this huge realization someday that the money isn't the biggest thing. In fact, no one on their deathbed has ever said, man, I wish I would have gained a little more money. So let's go back. Now listen, you rich people. No, somehow those slides got mixed up. Let's go. There. Look, the wages you failed to pay the workers who mowed your fields are crying out against you. The cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord Almighty. You have lived on earth in luxury and self-indulgence. You have fattened yourselves in the day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered the innocent one who was not opposing you. If you are so intent and so desperate to earn some more money, if that has become, let's face it, your idol, Anything that you put above God is becoming an idol. So if you're finding, man, my faith, my security 
is all in money, you are placing that above God and that is becoming your idol. And if you fall into that, you may find yourself in this category where the wages you failed to pay the workers are going to cry out against you. What James is talking about is back in the, that day, day workers would come and work in a field. You'd work your day's work, you get paid at the end of the day. You work a day, you get paid. What had started happening was some of the owners would have the workers work and say, come back tomorrow. They'd work, come back tomorrow. And then they started a policy where they would say, well, I'll pay you once the crops sell at market. Now, here's the problem. The day workers, they were li living paycheck to paycheck, which was day by day. They would work for a day, take the money that they earned, go buy the food that they needed, feed their family, go work for a day, take the money that they earned that day, go buy food, feed their family, and that's how it worked. All of a sudden now, if you start to delay when that happens, all of a sudden those workers are starting to suffer. And then people decided, hey, you know what? If I wait for a week, then I can say, oh, well, yes, I know I told you I was going to pay you X number of dollars, but now I think your work was only worth this much. Or, oh, you know what? Actually, it sold for less at the market than I anticipated, so I'm going to cut how much I pay you. They start to skim off the top of what they were already making because for them, their money was so important. They needed to build up more and more and more, and they were willing to cheat, willing to kind of work a deal that benefited them greatly, even though it caused harm to those in need. And we can get caught up. Maybe we don't hire people. But maybe we find ourselves looking for loopholes or looking for ways to cheat the system. Maybe we can get creative with our taxes. Maybe we can steal a little bit here, or a little bit there from our boss that they won't notice. Maybe we can promise to pay a friend for something and, and we don't pay them back with the whole intent of I need to keep this because that's where I find my security. That's where I find my hope. Then you fatten yourselves in the day of slaughter. That's an amazing image. <laughs> okay, so the image here is like cattle or some kind of livestock that as it's getting closer to when they're going to slaughter this critter, they're like, let's beep this puppy up, right? I mean, who wants a turkey that's like this big round on Thanksgiving, right? You, you want a nice big turkey, all that wonderful stuff. So if you are raising livestock, you're trying to plump these, these animals up so there's more meat, so they're worth more, and that sort of thing. Now, on an animal's point of view, Let's pretend you're a cow. And all of a sudden, you're like, life's good. I'm doing all right. Even if you're a free-range cow or whatever, you know, you're just kind of meandering around. Life's good. You have no idea what the future holds for you. You, know, you actually think, this farmer's so nice. He loves me. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, the farmer starts to really bring on the food. And you're like, this is fantastic. I'm even getting more food. I don't know what I did to deserve this, but man, he loves me even more, and it just keeps coming, and the food keeps coming, and you're so focused on all this food, you're like, this is great. I'm getting bigger. This is fine. I don't care. I don't even have to walk around anymore. Just bring the food to me. What she's doing, this is great, and you don't realize he's just fattening you up, and payday's coming, and your life is not going to continue and it's going to be a harsh reality. Well, we can get caught up in materialism. And we think, life is good. I have figured out a way to gain all this money and resources and finances. I'm working 80 hours a week, but man, look at my bank account. I'm, I might be swindling people left or right, but look at all the material items I have. And man, all of a sudden we get caught up and we start thinking, wow, I'm, I'm rising up in the social economical ladder, and so now I, I feel better about myself, and I have a better identity, and we get caught up in this, and we don't realize we're just fattening ourselves up with material items. And the day of slaughter is coming. I 
I don't think James is pointing to all rich people. And I don't think he was leaving out poor people. In fact, <clears throat> I think when you, you look at Scripture, again, it says the, the love of money is the root of all evil. And then it goes on, and the Scripture is very clear. Seek first the kingdom of God. Seek first the kingdom of God. So no matter where you are, no matter if your bank account is in the negative or if your bank account has a bunch of zeros at the end of a number, the question is, what is your attitude towards money? Are you trying to find a savior in money? Do you try to find your identity and purpose in money? Do you try to find your value in money? Are you trusting in money for your future? Because God is saying, look to me for all of that. Now, if you're a parent, I would hope that if one of your kids like invents something like, I don't know, uh, Amazon. And all of a sudden, they're making money hand over fist. And another one of your kids is barely squeaking by. As a parent, we're not going to look and go, I love this one with the money more than I love this one. God, our Father, isn't looking at us social economically. He's not looking at our bank account. He's loving us all equal. But he is asking, are you trusting me first? Are you looking for your value from me first? Are you looking for your security, your joy, your hopes, your dreams to me first? Because, again, if we put our trust in finances and in money and resources, we're putting that above our Father, which becomes idolatry, which is an area that gets sinful. So I want to encourage you today, no matter where you are, I want to encourage you to take an evaluation. Where is your trust? Where is your hope? Where do you find your true joy? What are you really relying on? If it's not God our Father, no matter what it is, if it's not God our Father, you, we need to make a shift. We need to seek first God. Build our relationship with Him. And when we can focus on God first, that's when we can continue to mature spiritually and grow in our relationship with him and grow closer and stronger. Let's pray. God, we just thank you for today. And oh, God, what an easy trap to fall into. We live in a culture that tells us that we should be looking out for ourselves and that we deserve more, that we should gain more, that we should be just focused on that bank account. God, help us to focus on you. God, it doesn't mean it's going to be easy. It doesn't mean it's going to be a bed of roses. But God, if we truly can focus on you, and if we truly submit everything to you, including our finances, God, that's when we can have the fruit of the Spirit, where we can have peace, hope, love, joy, patience, kindness, self-control. And God, ultimately, that's way more valuable than any dollar amount. In your name we pray. Amen.